Hello, Hello, everyone, and Hello. welcome. We're welcome to... live, pretend that we're ever live. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to another episode of, of the Animal Rights Show. Uh, we're, ve we're very pleased to have back um, as our special guest this week, uh, Laura Schleifer. Um, Laura was on the show um, last week and guided us through some of the historical, uh, religious, scientific, and philosophical events that have shaped our attitudes towards other animals and the creation of the stark animal-human divide. As animal advocates, we seek to remove this divide in our dismantling of speciesism, but will this lead to the liberation of animals that we are fighting for? That's the, the key question. Um, we're gonna, we did part one last week. Laura's gonna um, um, continue that, that from, that, from that point and talk about the um, European Enlightenment. Enlightenment, And um, we're hoping, if we can, um, with, with the time that we have, um, that she will go on in part two um, to explore further how concepts of animality have informed our oppression of others, including humans. And we will then look at what happens when this divide is removed in societies that still operate under power over hierarchical structures, with human in a self-appointed position of dominance and control at the top. Can those beneath ever be free from oppression and tyranny? Uh, as, as I said, yeah, Laura's going to take us through real-life examples of the shadow side of removing the animal-human divide, and as similar to last week, you know, welcome your contributions and we'll try to address them throughout throughout the show as Laura did a great job of doing that. So, um, yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, Wendy, did you want to do the hellos as well before we kick things off? Yeah, let's do the hellos. Um, so, we ha who do we have? We have, um, have I missed someone at the top there? It scrolls down, doesn't it? Oh, there we go. Sorry, hi, we've got Jonah oh, no. here. We've got Amber and we've got Terry and Elliot. Deb's here again, and Ronnie, we've got our familiar names here. We've got Louise and Tori, Rama, and we've got Philip. And Deb says, hi, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Deb, says Brian. <laughs> and we've got uh, Marion as well, who I believe is your mum. Is that right, Tom? <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> and we've got Bernie, just, just yeah. literally Bernie just said hi as well. So anyone who hasn't said hi, just please say hi. And yeah, do, do give us your comments throughout the show. We'll try and get to as many as we can, so. Hi, Ber 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 Hi, Bernie. Bernie's, Bernie's in Dublin, in fact, um, literally across the road from where I'm sat. So, hi, Bernie. So, uh, welcome, welcome. So, uh, let me get the screen up and then we'll... Um, uh, I've got to put this on. All right, okay. So, again, uh, Laura, we've... Um, I've made this into a... Into a a video again so there's, there'll be a little yeah so it's just the way i have to i have to do it because of my limited technology so uh, bear, bear with me on that but just if you just give me the heads up for when we change like last time it, it seemed to work okay yeah. so um so there's mr darwin i see and that that was that, that was that was when he was getting a lot of flack over the uh, natural selection idea wasn't it yes and i found this image actually very interesting because i know the story behind it is actually that's how he realized in that moment um, that humans had evolved from a primate ancestor was because he was actually um, visiting a primate um, in the London Zoo. And there was this moment, uh, her name was Jenny, and there was this moment where um, he looked at her um, and then he looked at his own face. I think she was an orangutan and he looked and he saw the resemblance. Um, so that's, that was that moment of realization. But I find this image also very interesting as a cover photo for this talk, because I also feel like it's showing the human, the human, the primate in them, <laughs> because, uh, he's, he's bringing that mirror to their face and saying, look, you are a primate. And very specifically, of course, as we will see, uh, this was really a, a message in large part to his fellow members of the European um, elite class because they, of all people, believed that they were separate and different and um, the epitome of the human as compared to other humans who they animalized. So um, that's kind of the story behind the uh, 
the image and the title, The Animal-Human Divide, Removing the Divide, Total Liberation or Total Annihilation. Um, so as we're going to see, uh, there's a very um, loaded sort of context of history uh, where there was, after Darwin appeared on the scene, um, sort of a removal of the concept of the human-animal divide, which you would think would be liberatory. And instead, because it happened within a context of still all this other types of oppressive ideologies and systems, it actually led in the most horrifying directions imaginable. So um, how is we going to focus on the idea of removal of the human-animal divide being a very, very powerful force. I believe it's a force that could be absolutely pivotal to total liberation for everyone, human and non-human animals alike, and the earth and everything. Um, or it could in the wrong way, it could basically to exterminationist ideologies. It could lead in very um, scary directions, as we'll see. So um, I think we're done with the intro. Uh, we can move on. All right, here. And um, one thing I would I would say is it's interesting going back to I think the nineteen seventies, not the eighties, uh, Wendy, but the seventies. Um, yeah, people remember that uh, that book, Desmond Morris, The Naked Ape. It was it was a really popular book, wasn't it? And like, I don't I don't think it was controversial at that time to to talk about ourselves as apes in that sense at least. So yeah, that I, uh, that's quite significant, actually, that um, it came out in the 70s because it was definitely influenced by Darwinism. There's no doubt about that. And you're right. By that stage, uh, this was commonly accepted, whereas when it first came on the scene, it was extremely controversial, this idea that um, not that humans <laughs> were primates, but specifically that white people and white ruling class people, more specifically white elites, that they were apes, uh, was very controversial. But by the time that book came out in the 1970s, it was much more commonly accepted. But as I said, you know, um, that wasn't necessarily in the liberatory way that we would think that that was more towards um, embracing animal rights and human rights and etc. Um, and the other thing, uh, as I will bring up in the future talk, is that the 1970s was actually a very pivotal time for a book like that to be released, because that was really the dawn of the neoliberal era. And the neoliberal era resuscitated a lot of the ideas from Darwinism and became very neo-Darwinist. So, and I should say social Darwinism, actually. So um, 1970s, that was pivotal that it was released at that time because there was a lot of that ideology coming out all of a sudden again at that time um, in, a in a major way. So we're gonna go all the way back now though to the European Enlightenment. Um, so we're talking primarily the 18th century, although um, started uh, the dawn, the origins of it could go back into the 17th century. And um, European Enlightenment era ideas regarding the human animal divide, there was a big shift there. And I want to state also that um, for the duration of this talk, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the philosophies that led to these events in history. Um, so I'm not going to be focusing as much on the events themselves as I am on the ideas that led to these things happening, uh, because that's very significant in terms of how animality was used as a construct or conceptions of animality um, to, to lead to these things happening. So several factors influenced this big shift. Um, the first was that there was a divestment from the influence of the church. Church became much less powerful. And this was a process that had been taking place actually was the Renaissance. So moving from the medieval period to the Renaissance, church got weaker. Um, then there was a big rebellion against the Catholic church, the Protestant church forms. Then of course we have the Reformation. Um, and then we come into the Enlightenment. But this process 
uh, was heralded by a number of factors, actually a really big one, um, <laughs> very relevant to our own time. Uh, it was started by the Black Plague, kind of causing this crisis of confidence of, well, where was God in all of this? You know? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I think we cut out there for a minute. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was the second that's the second time you did it actually, but um we'll we'll just uh fingers crossed. <laughs> right. <laughs> so as they were moving away from the church, um that got this divide away from the idea that it was ordained by God. They couldn't use that as a justification anymore if religion was not the ideology that was dominating everything anymore. They had to um, either maybe accept that it wasn't true or find to explain this supposed divide. Um, secondly, colonization. Uh, so this actually is very significant in a couple of ways. Um, so this is the era of European colonization of pretty much the rest of the world. And um, first of all, they were committing all of these atrocities against the populations that they were colonizing. And they had to find a way to justify and rationalize that in their own minds. Um, and again, you know, they were moving away from everything being about religion. So they had to find a way to justify this in terms that were not based in religion, or at least not entirely based in religion. Uh, the other thing was that colonization sparked the advent of capitalism. And when the Europeans were going to other parts of the world, of course, they were coming there um, with a mindset of, we want to get rich and we're gonna basically exploit this land, its people, its animals, its nature, we're gonna suck everything out of it. They didn't have any connection to those places that they were going to. They didn't have any um, bond with them or you know, they, they didn't value them for any reason other than what they could profit off of. And that really affected a lot of their thinking during this period about the populations in those lands and of course also animals and nature the whole thing was they were coming from an exploiter mindset um and because they were going there to produce wealth um any way they could i shouldn't say produce steal wealth <laughs> any way they could um because they were doing that there was this influx of wealth that destabilized the whole existing order of feudalism, the monarchy, suddenly the merchant class became very powerful. And there was this sort of like upheaval going on in the social structure in Europe. And you had the rise of this new class, uh, the merchant class that, you know, we ended up calling the, the bourgeoisie in more, you could say Marxist terms. So, um, and the new construct of race that came along with it, uh, again, to justify what they were doing to the populations they colonized. The last one is very, very significant in particular in terms of the connection to attitudes about animals and um, how humans relate to the rest of the animal kingdom, which was that during this period, because the church was less of an oppressive influence in Europe, um, there were a lot of restrictions lifted on uh, scientific research, which the church frowned upon. It believed that, you know, this was messing with God, that God didn't want you to know these things. Um, and uh, so they started doing a lot more research in that way. And they started to discover that through vivisection, um, other animals have a nervous system. They have brains that are very similar to human brains. Um, and it was very obvious that they could feel and they could suffer. And um, so this kind of threw this question of the human animals, it made it a question again. 
suddenly this um, fixed notion that there was this big gap between us and the rest of the animal kingdom was up for debate again. And that also raised the question of what separates us from them? Um, and what moral responsibility, if any, humans so have Laura, we, to other animals? We, sorry, Laura. I was going to say with this, it's, um, it's quite interesting, isn't it, with the scientific discoveries element of this, because it raises quite a huge moral paradox in, in that you've already alluded to, in that the knowledge that humans gain that has helped us to understand and see other animals and has, has played a big part in shifting their moral status is actually from testing, experimentation, vivisection, and of course that is still quite true today, although actually Very much. They, a, yeah. a lot of experiments performed on other animals are to uh, often to understand more about humans. And it's quite ironic, right. isn't it, considering there's the, you know, that the tests are morally justified because it said our fellow animals are unlike us enough to um, not have the same moral consideration as humans, and yet they're like us just enough for the, mm -hmm. for the data to be seen as relatable to humans. So there's there's a lot, there's, it's quite murky, that's, that subject, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And um, that's the whole thing is that, yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're, that's, that is a paradox. And they talk about this paradox even now of, oh, you know, we find out more and more, the more research we do on them, the more like us mm. they are, mm. but yet we have to then somehow rationalize the idea that it's acceptable to do these things to them that we would never do to another human. <laughs> Although again, then there's the whole construct of human because uh, not everyone who is actually a member of the human species is always treated like a human. And there have been and continue to be um, incidences of experiments being done on humans without their consent. So yeah, that is, it's a very um, complex issue for sure. Well, I guess, I guess the emerging elephant in the room there would be animal welfareism as an ideology, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And um, animal welfareism is uh, very much something that did come up during the European Enlightenment. Um, you had, and we're gonna look at some quotes, uh, some of which have elements of that. I would say Jeremy Bentham was a big proponent of animal welfareism, um, but he was also, I mean, his whole ideology was utilitarianism. And utilitarianism has been used to um, justify things like animal experimentation because, yeah, is a comment here, interesting that the church was actually anti-science as opposed to actually caring about animal welfare. Yeah, I, I would say that was definitely their main priority. It was not animal welfare. It was the fact that they thought that science was a uh, violation of the um, the power of God. So, um, yeah, the, uh, the issue of animal welfareism. So utilitarianism, of course, is used to justify animal experimentation at the same time because, well, you know, uh, <laughs> we have to um, sacrifice the one for the good of the many. And uh, that's been used in that way. But but yeah, there was a big question about what moral responsibility we should have towards them. Did they have, and by we, again, you know, this is, this is a very limited we. <laughs> I want to acknowledge that term is very loaded. But uh, yeah, this idea of what responsibility morally there would be towards animals. Welfareism, rights, nothing at all. Big question. So I think we can move on. So big challenge to the divide as based on religion. They weren't going to base it on religion anymore. And they had to figure out what they were going to do about this. Now, it's very interesting that every time this question comes up in the society, um, it's a big destabilizing influence because this idea of this fixed divide between humans and other animals is really a linchpin for, in a lot of ways, the whole ideology that's undergirding the society. Um, and I'm going to say also uh, that I'm using the term Western society because 
Um, I realize that's a loaded term and I'm actually specifically using it because it's a loaded term because it is an oppressive idea, but I'm talking about the oppressive ideas that came out of this, um, you could say white supremacy, right? There's a lot of different ways that you could word this. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm using it specifically for that reason because these are oppressive ideologies. Um, so yeah, we have something uh, from that era, a uh, painting that was done in 1832, a physiological demonstration with vivisection of a dog. Now, this was a, a big destabilizing influence because it, you know, as I said, it, it kind of throws everything into question. If, 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 if humans are just another species of animal, that would throw everything into question. And the thing about destabilizing ideology, uh, destabilizing ideas, is that they kind of present an opportunity uh, that could be transformative in a positive way, or it could go the opposite direction. <laughs> and, um, you know, people feel threatened. I'm sure people listening are familiar with the idea of, um, or the concept of cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, if it becomes something that they become afraid of and they have cognitive dissonance, they can then respond to that by slamming down on their original ideas even harder and coming up with all kinds of new ways to justify and rationalize the original idea. And that's really what happened in a lot of ways here. So we can continue. Yeah, it's a fascinating picture of that really, isn't it? It's, it's almost like some of them look as though they're looking off to a screen somewhere. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of modern kind of thing in there. And then there's a live, well, I, I mean, obviously both dogs are live, but there's one who is not being experimented on look, looking on too. So there's a lot going on in that picture. Really. Yeah. I actually felt that the people looking away, it was because they were actually disturbed by what they were seeing. And that picture represented that some people, you know, they were very aware that someone was on that table suffering and they were turning their faces away from it. So that's a really important observation. Well, um, the thing to note there, uh, Laura, is that the view sector himself is, is not looking at, at the subject either. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So that indicates that he also feels discomfort with what he's mm -hmm. doing, which mm -hmm. he should have. <laughs> um, it's interesting that there was a, a, a person in the back row who was looking down almost with a kind of detached level of curiosity, not having any, expressing any emotional discomfort in their face from that, that they were quite far back. Right. In the right, because they couldn't see yeah. it as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is a really, really important point too. Yeah. Um, um, and this this point too, I suppose, is interesting as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Rama Ganison saying people mm -hmm. watched human surgery at the turn of the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also there was some uh, desensitization process going on there, possibly as well. That may have had something to do with it. I don't know. Um, because again, these ideologies kind of all serve to desensitize people from this. And again, the, the people that were in the oppressive positions are the ones um, that I'm talking about here. So um, yeah, enlightenment philosophers on the question of our moral responsibility to other animals. So here's a good example of kind of this sort of weird <laughs> uh, framework that um, some of them were working off of. You had Immanuel Kant saying, he who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealings with men. We can judge the heart of a man by his treatment of animals. Mm. Sounds good, maybe. <laughs> Sounds like somebody who who cares about animals and um, what they experience. But then same philosopher, Immanuel Kant, <laughs> animals are there merely as a means to an end. And that end is man. Um, and of course, loaded term again what is a man in Immanuel Kant's eyes. Um, definitely, I would say a man like him, European, Christian, et cetera, et cetera, man, male, et cetera. Um, a, a wigged person. But obviously, you know, Kant, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Reagan is Kantian, but this is the very thing that Reagan challenged because right. this is all about indirect duties. Whereas right. Reagan argued that we have direct duties because of who other animals are rather than the effect it would have on humanity, which is what Kant is saying here, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, it is. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying that this is about us. And uh, it also very much goes into, again, this sort of like um, colonialist attitude of, you know, we are a moral people. We are a civilized people. We don't do those things to animals because that would degrade uh, our moral character. So very much not recognizing the other, um, you know, on their own terms. Yeah. Just, just, um, going, back, just going back to the to the um, to the picture. This 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 one is very famous. The experiment um, on a bird in an air pump is very famous picture, which uh, comes up. Uh, after that, people don't know that. It'd be worth checking that out. It's another, it's another very disturbing image, uh, as far as I remember. I haven't seen yeah. it for a long time, but it, it was. And Rama said something about the kink. Is that right? Oh, the, the nick. nick. The nick. No, I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and have you, have you seen the nick, uh, Tom? Uh, the nick, I haven't actually. No, I've written it down because I'm keen to uh, check it out. All right. What is that? It's a bit of an in-joke, to be honest, but <laughs> we'll let that go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, definitely, you know, you've got some weird um, sort of <laughs> rationale going on there. Um, I also want to say a word about Descartes. Um, definitely, there's a lot of animosity towards Descartes in the animal rights movement and with good reason. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to explain his position a little bit more clearly because it's a little more complicated than people probably think. Um, basically, you know, he made that comment about animals um, being just kind of like automata, um, you know, they're like machines and basically uh, you know, when you kick a dog, it's they have a reaction. It's like a clock, you know, um, or it's like a machine that stirs up for a second. And um, obviously, this was used to uh, kind of justify this very mechanistic way of thinking about sentient beings and objectifying them. And it's interesting to look at what he was saying, because at that time, there was this idea that, you know, coming out of the medieval period that um, humans or other animals were moved um, by, uh, well, it was humans really, it was not other animals, but this idea that it was a soul and for animals, it was an animal spirit that made them move independently and um, brought them to life. And it was, so when he said that, he was actually also applying this in many ways to humans. And he was saying we're much more just a series of neurobiological reactions than we realize. And if you do X, then Y will happen. You know, if you, you know, hit someone on the knee, they'll kick and it's an automatic reflex thing. But all of these things are really automatic reflex things. Um, but the big thing that he thought separated humans from other animals was that in his mind, only humans could reflect on their reactions to things. So other animals would just react, but then that would be the end of it. Humans would think and ponder about what that reaction meant. And that was the thing that he thought differentiated humans from other animals. So he didn't actually think that they didn't have physical feelings, but mm -hmm. it was twisted that way to justify a lot of um, treating animals like instruments and not like individual persons. We do still see that, I think, reflected in um, some opinions from folks, don't we, about the, um animals merely react instinctively that without feeling mm -hmm. and uh, that's exactly that. yep that's exactly where this is going right, right. because um, we're going to see how these european philosophers kind of reframed um, that you have a moral responsibility to someone uh, not based on their ability to feel and not based on their ability to suffer, but rather on their um, certain other traits, one of which is that they're not just instinctual, right? That they have the ability to think. Uh, yeah. That really correlates with them. I didn't know um, what that either before I did this research. It was very interesting. 
so Laura, I was just going to say that really ties in with kind of eco-feminist theory as well in that, you know, the, the binaries, the false binaries that are, that are brought into, you know, through the patriarchal thinking. And it is always, isn't it, nature kind of versus intelligence or instinct versus intellect. And then always the instinct and nature is, is made inferior. And it is that kind of yeah. false binary that really drives those paradigms. Yeah, big time. Eco-feminism uh, really tried to challenge a lot of this mechanistic instrumentalist way of thinking um, that really did come out of the Enlightenment. And um, mm -hmm. that is something that I think animal liberationists would really do well to look into eco-feminist writings and theories because I think that they could be very, very useful to um, helping us approach these issues in a way that doesn't fall into those patterns ourselves. Um, yeah, Descartes had a pet dog and how did he explain his dog's cognition when he, she dreamed? Yeah, exactly. He did have a pet dog and he was very fond of that dog. And that was actually one of the um, reasons that they said, oh, you know, this is a misinterpretation of Descartes that he thought they didn't have feelings. Oh. Because he clearly did. And he spoke about his dog having feelings. He would actually say, oh, she's angry. Or, you know, <laughs> so um, not only did he recognize that they had physical feelings, he actually recognized that they had emotions. So, yeah. And, you know, Voltaire actually had a very interesting response to uh, Descartes because he kind of flipped it around and he said, well, you know, you're claiming that you as a human have the ability to think and ponder and the dog doesn't, so you're morally superior and have moral, more moral value. They said, but you're the one who's experimenting on the dog and the dog has never given you anything but friendship and loyalty and mm -hmm. love. So who's the moral one here? So yeah, Descartes thinking um, definitely you could challenge in a lot of different ways <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we can move on. Uh, before we move on, I have uh, a question, Laura. Um... Uh, would you say that this uh, point of, in history, uh, humanity has moved away from uh, the binary human-animal and uh, there is a new hierarchy. Uh, we have recognized that we are animals too, but we are uh, superior animals. And mm -hmm. um, beneath the superior animal, uh, which in that era is uh, the uh, white European human, yeah. uh, are also uh, the races that were constructed uh, uh, about that time. Yeah, um, absolutely. What you're talking about is what happened after Darwinism. So prior to Darwinism, there was still this idea of the human, again, as a construct, not all humans were included in that, but the human <laughs> as being, you know, separate and not an animal and then everybody else was an animal. And then after Darwinism, that had to change because they were confronted with their own animality, these uh, humans who were trying to pass off this construct. So that really changed in a major way. But I would say um, that if you speak to just the average person, they still don't really think about being an animal themselves. It's startling to them to think of themselves as an animal. But what's interesting is that, um, you know, what came out of Darwinism, which was social Darwinism and this whole ideology that went along with it, you know, just the average person on the street's not aware of that, but people in positions of power and the people who actually create these ideologies are very aware of humans as animals. And, you know, they have constructed this whole worldview around that idea in these very oppressive ways that are still very, very influential today. Mm. Well, one thing that's very influential, of course, from a vegan point of view in particular, is the fact that we don't like to be called animals ourselves. Mm -hmm. But, we, but we, we deny our apism as well. But in particular, yep. um, a lot of people don't seem to understand that we're mammals. And yes. in particular, what that means Yes. In terms of pregnancy, lactation, and that kind of stuff. So they yeah. never make it, they never make a connection to dairy, which mm -hmm. is always fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, cows even go nine months pregnancy, so exactly the same as humans. Yeah. And yet, there's no idea of oh yeah, you know we're we're actually mammals too. That's why we have that's why we have mammary glands because <laughs> we're mammals. Um, and, and that's why we have like a mammogram, for example. People never think of that mam being 
mammal. Um, and yeah, you're right. I mean, it's still very startling to think of ourselves as animals, even, um, even for me, and I think about this all the time, I was reading this book by Franz de Waal, who's a primatologist, and I opened up the book and he dedicated it to his favorite primate, Catherine. And of course my first thought was, oh, that must have been one of the primates that he worked with. And I was like, wait a minute, I think that is what. <laughs> and I looked it up and sure enough, his wife is Catherine. <laughs> But it was like, I loved the fact that that was such a cheeky reminder that, you know, he's married to a primate, a primate wrote the book that you're opening, you are a primate that's reading it. I thought that was brilliant. I really loved it because it's true that it's so easy to, to forget those things. Um, so, yeah, reasserting the human animal boundary on secular terms but this big question now of how to determine what and who are considered human. So to reassert the human animal boundary, animal philosophers began to degrade feelings and emotions as animalistic. Why? Because they knew animals, other animals had feelings and emotions. And so therefore, they were like, well, we can't use that to make the dividing line. We're going to have to come up with something else. So they started to say, well, that's a lower quality. That's where this whole idea of emotions being lower and more base came from. And instead, they started to fetishize these conceptions of reason, morality, big scare quotes on these, and self-control. Um, and also, you know, along with self-control, this idea of not just acting out of instinct, but uh, having thoughts, free will, that's where the whole obsession with that starts coming in, in a secular term. Um, this whole idea of, oh, you know, I think, I think therefore I am. <laughs> um, so all of that was what made you a moral being and having moral value, rather than the capacity to feel and suffer as the traits that made one deserving of moral consideration and or fully human. So this idea developed that it was, again, not the ability to feel that determined moral responsibility to others or that separated humans from other animals, but instead, Europeans use these very, very culturally biased views of what constitutes reason, morality, and self-control to not only deny the moral value of non-human animals on the basis of them supposedly lacking these traits, but also to deny the humanity of humans who did not fit the European conceptions of those traits. So this led into humans can justifiably be treated like animals, quote unquote, if they're judged to be more like animals on this basis. So it became this project basically of trying to frame certain humans that they wanted to exploit or that they wanted to get out of the way of what they wanted or whatever it was to try and frame them in those terms of lacking those traits and being more like animals as a result. So um, I think we can continue. So did you say move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. In one of, um, I think in uh, defending uh, animal rights, uh, Reagan talks about, um, he's talking about the North American constitution. And he, mm -hmm. say, he says that um, not all humans are included in the term all men. Yeah, not, even, exactly. not even all men are included exactly. in the term all men as well. So that's- Yeah, really yeah, it's very subjective how they use this terminology. Um, so it's, here are some sneaky, examples. We're a sneaky species. We want it both ways, don't we? We, we want to, you know, with this and with that, but we're not really and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because you know the Europeans said, "Oh, it's our ability to reason uh, mm. that makes us unlike other animals." But um, you know, I would say, if anything, it's their ability to rationalize. <laughs> so to rationalize things that are unjustifiable, to rationalize things that are irrational mm -hmm. that's what sets them apart is actually um ego 
ultimately. Yeah, good point, yeah. Yeah. Laura, so, can I just ask you on that, on that, on that whole um, animality thing, because I know um, that that's, this is a kind of point, isn't it, within, within structures of oppression, is that animality becomes a tool and a justification for oppression, or different oppressions. And I know um, Af and Silco have, have talked about this in Afroism and racism as zoological witchcraft. And I think um, Mark Roberts talks about this in The Mark of the Beast. I don't know if you're, you're aware of that. There's, there's a lot of work with, you know, different writers yeah. talking about this. Um, but we even see it that still filters through today i mean in the way that in in everyday vernacular humans will use of course use other animals as insults and you know we hear, oh, you, you get called a in the english language you know you get called a cow a bitch or you're a rat you know if you're a snitch or you know you might be a snake a weasel a pig right. a dog all those things are still used just unconsciously by people every day so that still shows how prevalent that really still is mm -hmm. absolutely actually. and mm -hmm. that is actually one of the key indicators of some sort of human rights atrocity like genocide mm -hmm. um war you know that the, when that happens when there's some sort of big persecution or extermination attempt um you'll know it's coming one of the key indicators is because the group that's planning that starts referring to the other group as various types of animals. Mm. And that, you know, you don't, that doesn't come from the, human, the animal rights movement. I mean, that comes from like social psychologists like Philip Zimbardo, for example, talks about that, how, um, you know, that was such a key uh, tool that was used during the Iraq war to justify the um, extermination and torture of Iraqi civilians and Iraqi prisoners and you know so I mean this is like uh yeah. definitely something that you know human rights activists are very aware of but they never question this idea of maybe we shouldn't continue to justify animals being treated that way then and then we won't be able to use that as a justification that, for treating humans that way I think you're right this it, it does feed into this idea of, of, of culture and how the cult certainly in the West, the Western culture kind of reinforces these ideas. For me, when I was younger, I remember watching one of the Indiana Jones films, and there's a scene where he's with another actor, and they're trying to get through uh, a sewer, and the, um, uh, the production team put all these rats into the sewer, and they're attacking all the, all the rats, are sort of attacking, apparently attacking the humans. And it, as a child, I was quite horrified by the scene, but that reinforced a fear for rats, you know, that they were... They were vermin. As historically, they've kind of been uh, labeled in that in that way. Um, and obviously, you know, pigeons. I used to call them flying rats. Um, so, yeah, yeah, just an observation I wanted to share. Yeah, no, I and you're right. That kind of like puts that in your mind that you have that fear of rats. And then, if someone is called a rat, uh, for example, Jews were very much called rats yeah. um, in the lead up to the Holocaust, and that fear is already programmed into your brain then. So then you're gonna fear the person who's associated with it. If actually, um, you know, now with like um, knowledge of epigenetics, uh, we know that um, actually your brain forms a pathway between those two ideas, right? This type of person connects with rat and then rat of course connects with fear. Mm. So yeah, it's a very, very insidious thing of how that's used. So, um, with the um, European conception, this new construct of what separated a so-called human from a so-called um, less than human or non-human, um, these were things that they that they said were the indications of whether someone was moral, whether they had self-control, and uh, whether they could think rationally. And again, these were the key um, pillars that indicated whether you were fully human or not. So if you didn't meet these standards, then you went into the category of not fully human. Um, so these were things that they started to um, assign as traits or that they saw as traits in the people that they then classified as not fully human. So here's a list of some things that they associated as traits. Uh, in that way, um, nudity, state of undress, 
right, you're immoral, you're, you have no self-control, you're um, sexualized, and that's an indication of those things, immorality and lack of self-control. You're just instinctive, you don't have any thoughts uh, or you know, awareness of consequences of your actions. Um, polytheism, of course, you're not a Christian. Um, voluptuousness, body fat, big one. You have a transgressive body. You are um, out of control. You eat too much, <laughs> you know. Um, anything really to do with physicality, which really goes back to Descartes because he said, well, you know, other animals have a body and their bodies function very similarly to humans, but the human has a mind and it uh, thinks deep thoughts and other animals don't do that. Or he would just say animals. So, um, you know, really anything associated with physicality became classified in that way as animalistic. Uh, sensuousness, that goes along with that. Anything to do with the senses, oh, it's just physical um, and therefore animalistic. Um, of course, any kind of non-procreative, I'm saying non-procreative, but actually that's something I could say procreative, of course, out of the constraints of marriage. Um, and of course, it has to be a you know Christian marriage. <laughs> um, but all of these are signs mm. that oh, you're just animalistic, you're immoral, you're irrational, um, and you have no self control. And uh, those were the things that they used to justify mistreating people and in the most horrendous, violent, exploitative ways. And so, you know, of course, it's like this really weird subjective framing of morality and, uh, you know, that uh, these things are immoral, but then enslavement and genocide, that's perfectly moral. No problem there. Uh, so very strange framing there. Um, so these are some and images. It, and, it, that I, uh, and it's still true today. Again, again Laura, it's still very true today. We, we, can, we can't look at this and think, oh, well, this is this is just distant past because this is still going on. This is still, you know, in Absolutely. today's society, it's the obsession that people have with weight loss and oh. fat Absolutely. shaming and thinness. Absolutely. And then obviously pro procreative sexuality is really like, you know, the, and the importance of reproduction is, is a justification for homophobia and misogyny. So the, these things are still so prevalent and and still going on in our society, we, we, we can't sort of ignore the importance of, of, of this yes. as a foundation for the oppressive Absolutely. societies we have. Mm -hmm. Very, very much so. And uh, these images actually are from a new book that just came out, um, which is called, the title is Fat Phobia, but then the subheader is Fear of the Black Body. And the thesis behind this is very interesting because, um, so that's Sarchi Bartman, um, some of you who've seen talks on this subject or read papers on this subject, you may be familiar with her. Um, she was an African woman who was ugh, horrifying that the Europeans put her on display specifically for her body type. Uh, they called her the hot and top Venus. Mm. And they basically um, kind of, the, the, the reason why she's on the cover of this book is because um, what the author is saying is that this idea of fatness became associated with blackness because it was meant to be seen as an indication of their lack of self-control and therefore, again, more animalistic nature. Notice, of course, also that she's in a state of undress. They're all fully clothed. You know, all of these are supposed to be indications. Of course, it's a very sexualized image um, in the way that, you know, they're portraying her fat distribution or weight distribution. So all of this is, again, this reinforcing this idea of the moral, morally superior, you know, lots of self-control European versus the transgressive animalistic African. And- Laura, uh, yeah. may I have some, as you, as you uh, explain this, I'm thinking that although at this point, um, the church, the Christian church is not um, so powerful as it was in the past, it's still, uh, uh, it's still very powerful because I'm looking at all these words and uh, in my mind, I link them with, um, with the scenes. Gluttony, for example, is a scene. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, even sex was a scene. Uh, yes. Actually, uh, what is not approved by the church is not moral. Right, exactly. And that's exactly what it was, was that they took those same ideas and, you know, um, 
she mentions that it has to do with uh, Protestantism, right? And that's where you get also this idea of work is virtuous, you know, labor, you have to work hard and earn money and save money, which is again, self-control. Um, you know, all of this is very tied in with Protestantism at the same time. And, you know, you see later on that the social Darwinism, the eugenics, the Nazism, all Protestant countries, <laughs> England, America, and Germany, all three primarily Protestant cultures. So there is definitely a connection there to these ideas and that, yeah, this thinking, oh, I was just about to bring that up, also prevents Europeans from accepting parts of themselves. Yes. So this is the thing, is that when you stigmatize these traits and you say, well, if you have these traits, then that makes you more like an animal and therefore deserving of being treated, quote unquote, like an animal, um, it actually does serve as a force of terror against Europeans as well because if they develop these traits, they can be treated that way. So that's actually one of the main points of this book is that this was then used uh, to strong arm European women into dieting, right? Because God forbid, they start being perceived in that way. So it was actually used as a silent threat against them in addition to a dehumanization, depersonification against black women. Um, same thing with the anti-sodomy laws, right? All of a sudden, um, you know, this was a big thing. As you can see, sodomy laws represent neocolonialism. That's of course because these were British in large part and other colonial laws. Um, and same thing, right? That trait became more and more stigmatized. Then if you were, let's say, someone who was gay in Europe or, you know, in a white person and you had that trait, that was gonna reverberate back on you. You had to then hide that more because yeah. that would be, you would be then in that same category to a certain extent. Yes, your whiteness would protect you to a certain extent, but not fully. So um, yes, it absolutely did reverberate back on Europeans and uh, was oppressive to them as well, which is a really, really important point. Okay, so I think we can move on. Yes, indeed. It's really, I mean, this this is really down, down my alley here because I covered a lot of this in my PhD in the sense of, uh, you know the hot and sort of thing, but there's some sociological research about um, attitudes towards sex workers. Oh um, my God, yes. Yeah, so um, black sex workers were seen as animalistic, and so yep. you could kind of be more kind of physical with them. Um, Asian women were often seen as dolls, and so they were kind of delicate and small, and you know, all, right. all this kind of construction was all kind of there, there, yep. and thereabouts. As I think overall, the species barrier. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible idea that people use conceptually. I know you're going to you're going to talk about the Nazis and that, and they 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 were the kind of masters of it in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, conceptually casting a human being over the species barrier yeah. is, all you, is all you have to do, and then you can treat them in all kinds of incredibly disgraceful yeah, ways, like then. an animal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. So here's another one, um, racist European colonial depictions of the quote unquote immorality, quote unquote lack of self-control of the people they colonized. This one's especially ironic of course as well because it's showing First Nations people um, getting drunk, falling down drunk. Who brought them the alcohol? <laughs> uh, that was not from their culture, that was European pathology. Um, but again, very much these repeated associations of these qualities are animalistic and therefore justify you being treated like an animal. And of course, never the questioning of, is it even justifiable to treat an animal like that? Yeah, um, I was just about to bring this up. Yep, this was connected to the similar animalization of the underclass and inmates of psychiatric institutions during the 19th century. Yes, ableism is a big, big part of this. That is definitely gonna be coming up a little bit later on, yeah. So yes, we can move on. Okay, um, so we've got, we've got about five minutes uh, left of this session, Laura, just to mark your card as it were, but uh, we'll mm -hmm. move on to the next one. 
Yeah, so then the move from framing people as animals to treating them like animals. Um, I'm gonna have a few very brief uh, images because you know I do want to just make this clear how this happened. But again, my focus here is on philosophy. It's not on the actual actions that happened. Um, that would be very graphic and there's a lot of other lectures on that. And so, and also this is very long to begin with. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you can see though, um, this is ugh, disgusting. It's an ad for a human zoo. Um, this was Carl Hagenbach, who was a German, um, who would be put on these zoo displays. And originally it was only non-human animals. And then uh, he thought, oh, you know, Europeans don't have the chance to see all these uh, people from other cultures. And so, you know, put them on display too. And um, I mean, they were from all over the world. There's lots of horrifying images from all the many different po colonized populations that they did this to. Um, here's one, again, um, another, uh, displaying someone calling her baboon lady um, because she had a condition where she grew hair, you know, so you had like these um, freak shows, quote unquote, <coughs> that would animalize people and just all kinds of horrendous ways of reinforcing this idea that these humans were mm. not quite human, they were more like animals, and therefore, of course, that it was okay to treat them in these monstrous ways. So yeah, we can move on. Uh, it a little bit, I'm reminded a bit of the, um, I know this is based on a true story, but the film, The Elephant Man mm -hmm. by, um, by David Lynch. That's quite a, yeah. a powerful and sad yeah. film. Um, right. About a, yeah, person who's awfully treated. So yeah, we're fine. coming to um, the end of the presentation. And actually this is right where we come into the next chapter, um, which is, Darwin appears on the scene and he tells these Europeans that are making up the rules <laughs> that um, they're animals too, um, hmm. that they um, are a species of primate, that they came from the primate uh, evolutionary tree and um, that now Darwin did not, uh, unfortunately he still was very much a product of his time and his culture in a lot of ways. And he did still present this in hierarchical ways um, within the animal kingdom. Even though he included all humans in the animal kingdom, uh, he still presented the animal kingdom in a way that was quite hierarchical. Um, this image is actually a caricature of, her, of him because the European um, upper class, they were scandalized by this idea of them being primates. And, you know, this cartoonist was basically like, well, maybe you're a primate, Darwin, but not us. And uh, drew him as an ape man, quote unquote. Um, I'm just gonna say, you know, to round this up, this again was a very, very destabilizing moment. So again, this, you know, kind of force that comes in that blows this question, up in people's faces yet again that they have to think about this question of their own connection are are they animals or are they separate from animals and again there's this moment of this could be something that could really um serve to undo a lot of hierarchical ways of thinking and unfortunately the cognitive dissonance comes and then the rationalization comes and then it leads to yet more oppressive ideologies so in the next episode, we're gonna be talking about specifically how those ideologies played out through social Darwinism, eugenics, and even Nazism. And we're gonna be taking a look at what happens, you remove that divide, but you remove it within the context of still all these other hierarchies within human society. It doesn't end up being a liberatory force. It ends up harming everyone. Um, which is not to say that it's better than the, the divide being intact, but rather that removing that divide is a very delicate process and we wanna handle it in a way, it could be the most liberatory thing, we wanna handle it in the right way because otherwise it can go in the complete opposite direction to the way that we mean it. So that is my presentation for today.
What am I doing? Mm, thank you, Laura. Thank you Thanks, so Laura. much. Really, really yeah. interesting. So yeah. interesting. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. What, what I find really fascinating in all of this is is the human capacity to um, cherry pick. <laughs> yeah. to cherry pick information and to interpret in a interpret that information in a way mm. that suits us yes no matter yeah. no matter what it is no yeah. what we discover no matter what we uh, you know what evolves in front of us it's like oh now we can use this to prove this back to ourselves mm. and of course that's why our minds <laughs> are wired our minds are wired like that you know we have this mm. it's called a reticular activation system or um yeah in our in our brain that filters information to us based on our existing beliefs so this is why right. we have that bias and everything like that. So right. it's almost like we can't we can't help ourselves. But exactly. it's just really endlessly shocking. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean that really is such a good way of summing this up is that it's always, you know, whatever it is that's a new idea, it's always rerouted <laughs> back mm. into whatever the existing <laughs> ideology is, which means you really have to treat it at the root. Because if you don't treat mm. it at the root, then it's always mm. gonna find a way back. To, it's a bit yeah it's a bit like um kind of trying to reinvent the status quo and you know yeah. like when you said he's kind of cherry picking <laughs> manipulative mm -hmm. you know unreasonable ways you know right yeah right yeah. i mean and you look at like any um movement where there was a liberatory idea and you'll see that same pattern happening again and again and again mm -hmm. so that's why i really am a total liberationist is because mm -hmm it has to be done in totality. It has to be approached mm -hmm. comprehensively or else that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's one of many reasons anyway. Yeah. 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 I think okay. that is a, a, a good time to say thanks for everyone for tuning in um, as ever. And um, we shall see you for at least part three <laughs> uh, next week, folks. So, uh, <laughs> so thanks again. And um We'll see you around uh, the internet. Yeah, thanks, no everyone. Thanks for Thank all your you. comments. Bye. And thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank you.